Live from Broadmeadows, Victoria, this is Strong Australia with David Spears. Well, very good evening. Welcome to the program. We are coming to you live tonight from Broadmeadows in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. We're at the Hume Global Learning Centre, in fact, in Broadmeadows. It's basically a big library upstairs. There's a cafe here, various function rooms and conference rooms uh, around us. And we're here in what has been for decades and decades the heart of manufacturing, not just for Melbourne and Victoria, but for Australia in many ways. This is where heavy industry has been based for a long, long time. It's where Ford motor vehicles were made for many, many years until about 18 months ago when car making in Australia came to a close. Ford, Holden and Toyota. A lot of dire predictions at the time about what that would mean, that thousands and thousands and thousands would lose their jobs. Some even thought we might tip into a recession. Well, 18 months on, here we are in Broadmeadows, and yes, it hasn't been a smooth transition for everyone. There are hundreds still unable to find work, and there is still very high youth unemployment here in Broadmeadows, nearly 18%. But there are also some really positive signs, more than just green shoots, in fact. Industries that are undergoing transformation as we move from an older economy into a newer economy. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Not always easy. We've got the people who know what they're talking about with skin in the game here tonight to tell us about this experience. In fact, we have Graham Whitman, who is the President and CEO of Ford Australia. Very good evening to you. Harry Hickling is the Managing Director of APV, which is an auto supplier. And we're going to talk about auto suppliers and what this end of car manufacturing is meant for reinventing businesses like yours. Jeff Connolly is the Chairman and CEO of Siemens Australia. And Jennifer Westercott is, of course, the Chief Executive Officer of the Business Council of Australia, with whom we are doing this Strong Australia series around the country. Wonderful to have you all here tonight. Of course, when we talk about Broadmeadows, a lot of people uh, do immediately think about Ford. Um, this is where car making, as I say, has happened for decades. The Falcon produced just down the road from here. 18 months ago, that came to a close. Ford did give three years notice for the workforce. About 600 lost their jobs, but a lot of people wouldn't know this. You still employ, what is it, just over 2,000 people in Australia? That's right. We have about 2,000, actually just over 2,000 people. The bulk of them just down the road, probably about a couple of kilometres down the road. They're not making cars. No. What no. are they doing? They're, 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 their life is built on the legacy of the Falcon uh, and the Territory. We've taken what was a really fantastic vehicle and a, and a history and actually used that to move forward. And, and those people now work on programs that will uh, see the light of day in very different uh, guises around the world. So the Ranger is an example, driven in more than 200 uh, markets around the world, is globally led developed and engineered literally about two kilometres away from here. So, and where is it actually made now, the, the Ranger? It's made in a number of plants around the world. OK, but you can buy them here in the Australian oh, market. Absolutely. They're, they're the second most popular vehicle in, in the So country. designed designed here, um, and that's been terrific. Is it? This, are these the same workers, though, who were making the cars, who made the transition into designing them now? Look, in some cases, that's exactly who they are. So, you know, October 7th in uh, 2016, uh, you know, we finished our, our manufacturing and about 160 of those 600 or so employees actually walked down the road the following week and essentially started a new career with Ford. It's a very different skill, though, isn't it? Uh, in some instances, yes, but, I mean, we had highly skilled um, people in our, in our plants and their transferability of skill was actually quite useful, not just even with Ford, but other companies around this area like Dulux and Mission Foods and the like. But, you know, we had people who were working in our paint shop one day and then a week later they were sort of clay modelling in our design studio, you know, 200 metres down the road. So, Which is terrific for them, about 160 you say, but yeah. there are obviously uh, hundreds more who, uh, you know, weren't able to stay at Ford. Do you know what's happened to them now? What's their experience been? Well, as you mentioned, we, we gave a three-year transition period, very much uh, with a view to have an orderly transition for our employees, for our supply base, for our dealers. And of the 600 or so employees that I, I sat and chatted with on the final day, about 80%, 80 just over 80% now have uh, either found work or retired. Um, and their pursuit. So uh, it's, a, it's a reasonably uh, successful outcome. Having said that though, you have to acknowledge that it was an emotional time as well. Yeah, and there'd be some who have retired earlier than they might have wanted to. There'd be some who haven't got enough work, you know, underemployed, uh, I'm sure. And, and that isn't easy in a, in a part of Melbourne 
uh, like this, I'm sure you'd acknowledge. You know, and it can be difficult. We were fortunate with the amount of time we were able to give our workforce. You know, we retrained them. And, you know, retraining is a theme we're going to talk about tonight. Yeah. And, you know, we had the ability through that period of time to retrain them in many different industries, ranging from, you know, security guard, a heavy duty and driving. And you helped with this? Oh, yes, absolutely. So we would uh, allow that within their work time. We actually paid for it. Um, you know, but it, it, it would range quite dramatically. We had, you know, literacy and numeracy training uh, all the way through to some of the aged care type training, looking to try to diversify their ability to go into different types of industries as we uh, face that manufacturing. Now, Harry, you uh, run APV. It's an auto supplier. Uh, before we actually hear from you, we've got a little uh, video to play, which kind of explains what you do and how you've had to change what you do as someone who had three customers, uh, Holden, right. Ford and Toyota in Australia. <laughs> uh, but now, of course, it's a very different scenario. Let's just have a look at that. APV is Australia's leading industrial test organisation and we also manufacture uh, seat belts for the automotive aftermarket, defence, bus and coach, truck and material handling markets. Pre-2008 our three customers were Ford, Toyota and Holden Australia. It's easy. The decline and closure of the automotive industry you know, forced us to have to fundamentally rethink our business. We weren't exporting internationally, so we had to reinvent ourselves as a company and work out what our future business was going to be. We've had to do both of that, you know, hire and fire. Not a lot of firing, but we've had to do restructuring through the process. And, um, you know, you never want to fire anybody, but, you know, we've, we've downsized a lot. Our export strategy has fundamentally been key to our reinvention as an organisation. It sort of reminds me of the post-World War II era in, Br in Britain, which was the uh, slogan of export or die. I've been working with the, here for the last 30 years. The changes I've seen in the car industry is a lot of car industries has gone out of Australia. So from there to APV, we started making aftermarket belts and, and then from there we started doing the rejectors for US and China markets. We've had a long-term relationship with Ford here in Broadmeadows. Our organisation has basically transformed with Ford the way Ford's gone through their transformation journey. In the past, we were crashing Ford Falcons you know, here to determine their safety. Today we're working with them with their new development programs. I've been with Ford for almost five years now through a wide variety of positions and experiences leading into me into my current role as a seatbelt engineer. Ford Australia has transformed their business from a vehicle manufacturer through to a product development hub for Asia Pacific. The closure of the automotive industry really meant that we had to rethink our business because it was such an essential part of our company. So it was fundamentally an absolute shift in the direction of our organisation and our backs were against the wall. You know, we couldn't make a decision to do a close down. We had to find a way to reinvent ourselves as a new business. Harry, as you said there, you had to find a way to reinvent yourselves. I was really interested that you didn't even have a brand name, uh, you know, when, when car making was going on, you didn't need one. Absolutely not. We had intimate relationships with Ford and to Toyota and Holden. So they would come to you and say, we need a widget. We need a widget. And, and our job it. was to make the widget better than anybody else in the world. You didn't need to market it. You didn't need a sales team or marketing team or... Correctly, uh, correct. And that's the biggest challenge that the supply base has faced with the closure of automotive. Because for the, for the biggest challenge they've got is you know, what are we as a business? You know, what's our core skills? Who's our customers going to be? What's our innovative products we're going so to sell? So how did you do this? How did, when, when all of that happened, and yes, you had the notice, you knew it was coming, did you uh, need to bring in expertise around how do we market ourselves? How do we find new customers? How do we start exporting these terrific seat belts and other widgets? How did you do that? 
Uh, excellent question, David. We did bring in uh, some expertise with the branding. Uh, so we threw some ideas around the brand. We kept the old name, which is Australian Performance Vehicles, which is a bit like BHP, has got no relevance to what we do today. But, you know, APV Safety Products is about restraints. APV Engineering and Testing Services is about survivability, safety, uh, industrial testing services. So it's a professional services organisation. Um, so the branding gave that anchor. And then uh, which market was really a personal choice? I was most comfortable tackling America. You know, I know the states well. It's a country that is um, easy to deal with. For an Australian, you know the legal constructs of the law. So is that where and that's your where we started. go now? Correct. Yeah. Right. So we're exporting 200,000 components into America, 80,000 by China. And which vehicles are they going They're into? Primarily the bus and coach industry and then we are the dominant player in the military market for amphibious and land-based armoured personnel See, that's carriers. that's a whole new market that uh, you've Ab opened up there. Absolutely. But we leveraged off the automotive expertise. Yeah. So, and where we are the most competitive is in that defence marketplace because that's about the, how the vehicle structure performs, how the seat performs, how the seat belt performs. It's system level design. Mm -hmm. And the traditional players, our, tr our competitors, don't have historical experience in that market. Nevertheless, you're a smaller outfit than you were uh, a few years back, right, yep. when the car making was still happening in Australia. Blunt question, where would you rather be? Where you are today or where you were then? It's more exciting where we are today. And the reason for that is, is because we control our own destiny now. We, we have our, a global hmm. brand. People around the world know who we are. Um, people contact us. To, for solutions. Um, Ford is still a customer. We've had a relationship with Ford for over two decades and we're still testing vehicles like Ford Ranger. Do you think though that some of the people who used to work for you might feel a bit different, those who haven't been able to survive? Sure. Um, but I think, as I said earlier, um, as a CEO and company director, one of your primary obligations is to actually ensure the future of your business. Yeah. So, you know, you have to make some tough decisions and... And look, you're still here. You're and still, we're still here. That's you're right. still... And you, 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 you're thriving as best you can. Have other auto suppliers hit the wall, though? Uh, yes, and there's still be, there will still be some further consolidation in the industry. Um, so, but there are a number of suppliers which have transitioned into defence. And if you look at the Australian transportation industry, it's much bigger than what we classified as automotive. Mm. So you've got you know, bus and coach, truck, mm. um, automotive aftermarket. It's still a significant industry. And I think just a point here as well. So part of that transition plan, not just for Ford but other manufacturers, was trying to make sure that the supply base uh, we're in a solid uh, position. So, you know, we had 103 suppliers right. uh, post-manufacture, uh, of which 60 carried on with us. 19 of that 60 now have global contracts. We ran supply fairs, we took trade missions to China, trade missions uh, to the US to try to find... To help um, them out. To help yeah. them out, because at the end of the day, we, we've got a responsibility, you know, we're a good corporate citizen, um, and we knew that if through that diversification and also comply, uh, global opportunities were to come, uh, we needed to help the supply base in, in doing that. Now, Jeff Connolly, let me bring you in here. Tell us, or tell, tell everyone what Siemens does, and particularly when it comes to businesses that are going through transition and transformation. Okay, globally, Siemens is uh, 370,000 people, the largest engineering house in, in Europe. Uh, the organisation's a technology company, industry, energy, infrastructure, and cities and healthcare. You might see CTs, MRIs, for example, so high tech, high tech equipment. Uh, in Australia, we've been here actually since 1872. Did the first overland telegraph project in 1872 and stayed, time, stayed for a while. So I'd say we're in the country for the country. Yeah. Um, and, and again, from an Australian perspective, uh, what we're very keen on doing now is uh, equipping industry with the sorts of technologies and efficiencies they need to compete globally. So what does that mean practically? Um, I mean, 
for a medium-sized company like mm. APV, what would what would you do? I, I would say for a medium-sized company, it starts off with automation. Starts off with understanding what's happening inside your plant, understanding where the constraints are, and trying to automate those things out. Uh, Digitalisation and what the Germans have called Industry 4.0, at, at least in the first instance, is about being competitive. And the need to be competitive, um, one of the ways to get there is to reduce non-conformance costs. The digitalisation, the ability to handle data, has massively increased. Uh, and with that capability comes, I think, lots of opportunities from an Australian perspective to tap into that. So. Do you accept there's still pretty uh, scary concepts for a lot of people, though, as Absolutely. well? The words automation, the words digi digitisation, for a lot of people, equals fewer jobs. Yeah, look, I, I actually accept that, and that's uh, why I'm also keen on the Industry 4.0 approach that's been, it's a framework. And what is that? Uh, so anybody, some people might come to you and say, I'll sell you one now. It doesn't actually exist, because the, the, the beauty in the way that's been formulated is to say, there is a world out there in 30 years forward that's cyber-physical, the way we will manufacture from a production perspective. Uh, we're not there yet. There's a lot of things we have to get in place to get ourselves there. There will be the transformation of jobs, the new skills we need. So what would it mean in this example? I mean, how many people does it take to make a seatbelt, a quality seatbelt that you're going to sell I've, to I've the United just, States? So I've just come back from China and viewed and benchmarked production facilities like our own. Um, they're world's best practice, we're world's best practice. They're f uh, less than five ppm, which means uh, very high quality levels, um, a great workforce. Our automation on both lines is ensuring that 100% check of every product. So both of our production lines have got automation in place yeah. to test the product so we can guarantee that everything leaving here when it arrives into a production line or into a vehicle in the US, which could be months away, it's actually going to perform as it was designed okay, to do. Okay, but, but I mean, can you give us a rough idea of, um, you know, on a seatbelt production line? It's basically th uh, three or four people. Three or four people. Is there scope for further automation? I mean, is that something that you guys would come along and say, here's what we think you can do? Uh, I, I think there's always uh, opportunity to optimise process. You're taking out waste, you're taking out cycle times, you can get more production through yeah. with the same number of people. And I think uh, we've got a, a flagship uh, factory in Umberg in the middle of Germany, and it's actually the factory where we make our automation equipment. Yeah. And it's highly automated. We've got the same amount of employees there now that we had 10 years ago, but the, the, but the output in that factory is 15 times more. So do you, do, do you accept that for those three workers in this example, that's going to be a little worrying to think that this further automation is coming soon, it's going to be one person on that production line? Well. I really honestly think possibly it's not one person. It, again, it's probably that uh, you might have still four people, they might have different skills, uh, will be employing more engineers, um, but will have much higher levels of productivity. And the thing is that um, we're going to hit a brick wall in our workforce in the next five years with people just coming up to retirement. So we've got this whole skills and retraining issue ahead of us. And I want to come to that later on because that's, that's a really important area for any industry that's trying to change what it does, trying to look to new markets, is, is reskilling the workforce. So I think the automation plays yeah. a role in that. Yeah. Well, Jennifer, let me bring you on this because I know you've spent a lot of time thinking about this very issue. Um, automation, as I say, is scary for a lot of people. Why is it so important, though, for small, medium and big business in Australia and in places like where we are here in Broadmeadows to not be afraid of it and to um, understand yeah. what's at stake? Well, I think what we heard today was just a great story of hope and optimism. I mean, to Harry's point, you, you know, he, he will be producing more if he can export more. But if he doesn't have the technology, if he's not able to reduce those cycle times, if he can't compete, then there's a factory, then in, there's China a factory in somewhere else. Well, the China that example is a good one, right? Uh, and we're exposed to it. And we're exposed to it. Yeah. So I think the, the challenge for Australia, and listening to everyone today, is we've got to face into this. We've got to be honest 
about what is happening in the transition of our economy. Uh, and we've got to make sure that we get everything right and that we work in a more cooperative way so we don't leave people behind. But that's about retraining and reskilling, which we'll talk about later. But is this just, sorry, Graeme, just to bring you in here, is this essentially what's happened with car making in Australia, with Ford, without reliving everything that fed into the decisions of, of yours and Holden and Toyota? Um, the product can be made cheaper in other parts of the world. You need to now move into an area where you can specialise and succeed on an international market. Look, I mean, there's well documented reasons why we, we uh, had to finish manufacturing. Less frankly about automation. I mean, the automotive industry, um, in terms of automation, probably indexes about 10 times the norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and so we're, we're well advanced. In fact, probably automation for, automation for us at the moment is about cobots and looking to augment cobots. Yeah. So cooperative yeah. robots, okay. right? So okay. literally alongside a worker, right? Yeah. Uh, because of the benefits in terms of quality, uh, productivity, or in some cases customization. So applying the human endeavour around customization as opposed to the repeatable elements exactly. of the task. Right. Exactly. Um, but in our instance here, is, it was quite simply a scale, remoteness, yeah. uh, and consumer choice at the end of the day. Yeah. And I think we've got to change this conversation to one of fear. Uh, to saying, you know, we've, we, there's so much opportunity that we heard about today and, you know, uh, the car industry isn't dead, it's different. It's profoundly different. It's high tech, it's engineering, it's world leading centre of excellence. Harry's business is not dead. Uh, it's, it's now got an export platform and your point about looking to the future. Um, you know, manufacturing is not finished. It's profoundly different in the way that Jeff's described. That's what we've got to sort of make sure we, we talk to Australians about that. So and, what does, and what we are, we what are still in the auto manufacturing industry. Exactly. We're just doing, exactly. right. We're doing a different. part of it from Brunel. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You exactly. know, you can still design a cockpit piece for BMW from exactly. Australia. Where it pops out to finally get produced is another question. Yeah, but uh, this, this comes to, uh, you know, what you both need to thrive once upon a time, not so long ago, you were focused just on the Australian market. Uh, largely, I appreciate plenty of vehicles were exported as well. But um, now your your customers are uh, you know uh, around the world. Mm. So we need we need what trade deals. We need trade deals. We, need, we, need, we, we don't open, need trade barriers. We don't need trade barriers. Absolutely. We don't need a trade we, we need, fair we trade. We need to absolutely. be competitive. We need to have an incredibly skilled and capable population and we need to be able to bring people through. We will need to, you know, to, to make sure we've got some openness to skilled workers coming here because you do need occasionally to sort of top up uh, the skills that you've got here. Uh, we need a much more flexible workplace relations system because people are going to have to work differently, we're going to have to change really quickly. We can't uh, pretend for a minute that somehow we could just put a wall around all of this and hope it doesn't happen. And that his, that his, would be a terrible unfairness uh, to Australia. And, and we also need to create a future for our children. Absolutely. And give, make this an exciting career for them to be in manufacturing. Absolutely. Because the young, we've started re-employing young graduate engineers for the first time for five years, and those kids learn so quickly and they're mm. now some of our best engineers and they're much more flexible and broader in their approach than if you would remember in the old days, you know, an engineer sitting mm. behind a mm. computer screen doing some CAD. Our engineers are on the phone to customers in the US and overseas about what problem they need to help solve. I mean, some, great, some great examples. You take companies like Morand, for example. Mm -hmm. They're participating in the in the construction of Joint Strike Fire. They're using yeah. global engineering collaboration tools, Team Center in that particular case, but the, the design tools, they have to be able to use them to participate in something that's, uh, let's say, coordinated from the United States. But there are 600 supply pieces around the world. They're just one. That thing will come together in Australia. Now comes the project after. With the skills they've learned on those, global supply chain tools, they're going to be able to participate Certainly. in other projects that won't necessarily be for Joint Strike Fighter for Australia. Well, and funnily enough, it, we have a, a point of competitive advantage just by the, our geography. So because our engineers in the morning are in um, conference calls mm. with engineers in the States with BAE systems or a customer, the following, by the time that customer comes to work in the morning, they'll have a solution on their desk. And in the evening, you know, they can be talking to people in Europe. Yeah, the game has changed. It's changed a lot. The game has changed, absolutely. <laughs> Look, I want to, we're going to take a quick break, and I want to come to 
how we make sure we've got the right skills mm -hmm. for, for this uh, exciting, evolving uh, manufacturing future, uh, but also what some of the other pressure points are that can be addressed. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're live tonight in Broadmeadows in Melbourne's northern suburbs, looking at the future for areas like this when it comes to manufacturing and industry and the change that's underway. Graham Whitman, the President and CEO of Ford Australia, we were just talking earlier about an example on the shop floor, someone who worked in your paint shop, mm -hmm. uh, then transitioning when car making finished into car designing and working on the clay models. Now, um, you yeah, know, they're not completely unrelated skills, uh, but I, I would imagine there's a fair bit of reskilling that has to go on there. It really depends on the situation. I mean, you know, some people have a, a foundational understanding of our business and how cars get put together. Yes, they have a sense of proportion, a context around design, an interest and a passion. That's that's a lot of attributes to mould. It's with. a good start. It's a very yeah. good start. And then put in that environment. It does Nonetheless, they need, need some. Do they need to go off to TAFE? To... Uh, it really, really depends. So in some instances it'll be on, on the job. I mean, we have other instances where we have sent people to TAFE uh, and, and gone through some pretty rigorous apprentice-like uh, retraining to ensure that they can go into more technically orientated activities. Yeah. But, you know, we've had other people come out of our, you know, our material planning logistics functions and now work in our marketing and sales organisation. Right. We've, we've allowed a lot, of, a lot of diverse movement because at the end of the day, very well skilled people understand the business why, why wouldn't you give those people a chance yeah and look Jennifer this comes back to something that you've talked about for a long time and that's you know lifelong yep. skills and uh, the, the, the need to be able to update um, yep. change what you do yep. and how, how do you do it well, I think we do a couple of things first the, the first thing is we've got to make sure young people make better choices and that they've got much better information. What do you about, mean by that? It's too, well, too many people well, going off to too many university, people going to doing university, an arts degree. Too many people doing law, probably. Um, and, and not enough people thinking about or getting the right information about what, what, if I study that, what can I do? Uh, maybe I don't need to do a particular occupational thing. I need to acquire a set of skills. I need to have work-ready skills. Um, so we need to make sure people do the right qualifications. You know, first. a lot of people watching are going to go, Tell me what the right qualification is. I don't <laughs> know what to they, do. Of I don't course know they are. And it's going to be different. But I, if, 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 you know, like... Because a lot of people do law because they probably think, oh, that'll set me up for yeah, a whole bunch of options. Yeah, it'll set you up, all right. I'll make my but, decision <laughs> later on. That's right. But, but look, you know, people would be astounded if you said there's a thousand job classifications. Now, how do I, if I'm a young person leaving school, uh, work out, um, you know, what is going to be right for me? So the first thing I want to see is a really good... Uh, tertiary information system that I can say, well, if I do this course or I do one of these bits of course, I'll do this and I'll do this, I'll be able to get into that industry. Not necessarily to have that job, but get into that industry. And we need the education providers to sort of wrap around that. The second thing, to your point, is that people have to have a capacity to retrain and reskill. And that's why I'm kind of keen on this lifelong skills account where I, I would go, you know, in, in Graham's industry, I might need to go off and do some literacy training because I've, I've got to now upskill my literacy and numeracy. I've got to do a particular digital qualification. I need to know a little bit about how to work with robots and artificial intelligence, but I don't need to go to university and do an AI degree or a robotics degree, but I, do, I need to be able to get a module of this and a module of that. So this lifelong skills account that I'm proposing would be made up of a subsidy from government, a loan that the learner would provide, Graham or Harry, or Jeff would say, look, I need you to upskill, or a person could see that coming, they go and get something from TAFE, something from university. This will drive incredible innovation in the education system, and, and we've got to be much faster at it. It sounds it sounds like a very attractive idea, but it is also quite a radical idea. Yep. Jennifer Westacott, as you know, the university sector don't like it at all, yep. Yep. because you're talking about the funds that currently are allocated sure. largely at Hex. Uh, yeah. for the universities. Yeah. Well, well, the first thing I'd say is that the big transformation we have to make in Australia is to see VET and universities as a dual track system, like the, like the German system, side by side, not VET being a second class citizen to a university qualification. But, but it is true it's radical change, but we're going through radical change in our economy. And if we keep our education institutions uh, basically where they were, you know, yep. a long time ago, if we are not able 
to give those young people that Harry's talking about, or people who are in their 50s or 40s, a quick chance to reskill into quite specialised technical areas, the sorts of things Graham's talking about. Well, Jack, we will fail the Australian yeah. people. So we, we can't just do nothing about this, and, and it will be adjustment. But I tell you what, the big adjustment will be if we don't fail, if we fail to reskill the population, then those jobs yeah, will go somewhere else. Jeff, you're at the cutting edge of this. I mean, do we have the right skills, particularly amongst young Australians, to meet these jobs of the, of the future? Uh, I've heard more recently that we actually don't have a shortage of jobs, we have a shortage of skills yeah. in what we need in the new capabilities. Um, as part of the work we were doing on the Industry 4.0 Prime Minister's Task Force, uh, Swinburne University, um, having a TAFE history, but actually offering now undergraduate courses and research with a pilot program to introduce a model from Germany. So we took a, a we started an apprenticeship program, a vocational educational um, uh, model pr apprenticeship program, took 20 kids, employed them and had them swinging backwards and forwards between ourselves and, and the university, co-sponsored by Australian Industry Group in this case. Uh, and, and the curriculum is exactly around the modern tools of engineering, simulation, CAD, CAM, production. What do they need in those sorts of 16 modules they've got to do over two years? Uh, and it's been a resounding success. And we get a lot, a lot of pushback to start with, of course. Um, but what Swinburne is doing is disrupting that model mm. because they're actually saying is a continuum here. They were they were seeded with massive amounts of industrial software. 150 million commercial value of software went to Swinburne. We said you can have that, but you must let the TAFE kids use it and learn on it the same as your undergraduates and your, and your PhDs. And that model's been replicated in five states around Australia to try to get a full momentum for some of the universities and the group of eight universities, uh, UWA and UQ, will have the same offer, but they have to work with the TAFE and they have to actually uh, share the resource because we can't do it as, well, as you said, separately. Well, I, Seems I, to I make think sense. there are some nascent, so, so, some green shoots. I mean, we, we're involved with many pathways. So, you know, we have uh, some of the most senior engineers mentor STEAM children and in a, a secondary college not far from here and down mm. in Geelong, so we do that. We have apprenticeships with TAFE, um, you know, we run a Ford mm. Academy, we do that. But the one thing where I say I see green shoots is I, I'm involved with the Australian Research Council and I'm in a steering group looking at um, the engagement and impact assessment tying to industry. And so there's a group of us trying to bend the ear of what I would call the purest mm. of, of academia to try and make it not just pure but mm. also relevant. Exactly. And I think, you know, as, a, as an organisation that's very uh, centred in R&D, what we need is we need, we need a, a strong and capable environment where, you know, tertiary institutes, research institutes uh, are strong but also have linkage into industry. And do they have that at the moment? What's your experience? Uh, Mike, well, we have, we have 20 university research projects right now, over five different universities. We do that right now, light weighting, mm -hmm. industrial transformation, alternate fuels. So we try and encourage that because that's the lifeblood of what we do anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think we're probably, uh, you know, probably a little bit more progressed than, than others, mm -hmm. but I would like to see that more, more proliferated and actually more regular and, and the norm uh, across some of the, the key industries uh, in Australia. I, I can see a great utility Absolutely. in that. Absolutely. Just, Harry, what's your experience been um, when it comes to finding the right skills you need and, and what you think you're going to need as the as the business changes. Uh, well, I'd say two things. I think first of all, um, it's incredibly important that we generate these skills in our young people because for our business to grow and thrive and be internationally competitive, we have to take innovative product or unique services to the market, and. So we need to bring the new ideas and the innovation in. So that, that's that part of the equation. On the other side of the equation, we have a workforce um, on the shop floor that has been working for us for 30 years. And that will have 20, 25 people come up to retirement in the next five years. So for us, reskilling uh, and capturing the knowledge mm. in those people is going to become a real important issue for us. Mm. Mm. And that's where I think, um, you know, the, the concepts in terms of how we reskill people, how we take advantage of automation, you know, how we take advantage of AI is going to be important because the knowledge in these people yeah. um, at, in terms of our business is incredible. Mm. But, and that's the strength of our business and we need to be able to protect it mm. for the future. Mm.
I'm just going to just add uh, another couple of uh, elements to what needs to be done. Um, we talk about the level of cooperation between organised labour and uh, employers. Uh, the model that is adopted in Europe, of course, is a code termination model in Industry 4.0. The, the, the most powerful union in Germany as, is at the table defining what the jobs of the future are together with industrialists. And I think we have to be mature enough in Australia to get that conversation there happening. There's a long way from that to, here. To, well, it could be, but I don't think, I think in this particular case we've got to do it uh, uh, together. So you would say... Because the dislocation potential is very large. Yeah, what you're talking about here is a union leader sitting down with the, the business leader and what, working out well, where automation is going, where this business is I'm, going. I'm not so, so much advocating that. That's a very German model, actually, in the code determination of the unions at the, at the management level. What I'm saying there is in the, in the, in the work, uh, work stream that's looking at the future of work, there needs to be understanding, and in, in the case of Industry 4.0, Andrew Detmar from the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union is co-chairing the work stream Future of Work and the definition of those courses to make sure that they understand that the apprenticeships of the past are not quite the apprentices of the future and also seeing that large corporations see that they have a responsibility to do more heavy lifting. In the past, I guess, you know, we were lucky that we took finished product from education, tertiary education institutions. We have to participate much more well, in that education. But speaking now. of the, the union movement here, uh, are particularly concerned, as are many, about flat wages at the moment, Jennifer. Um, you know, and it's there for all to see. Wage growth uh, is barely kept up with inflation now for quite some time. Um, and, you know, talk about automation, more robots and so on, uh, that's not going to necessarily see uh, driver wages uh, rise either. And, and now unions are saying they need stronger bargaining muscle. They need to be able to bargain sector-wide, for example, uh, and use the strength of numbers right across a, an entire sector. What do you say to that? Well, well, the only way people can get higher wages is if companies are more productive, uh, that they're more successful, they're more competitive. By productive, I mean they're able to actually do more, more things more efficiently, that they can tap into new markets, uh, and then someone either gets a better job gets higher wages, someone who was working less hours works more hours, someone who wasn't working, one of those 17% of young people who aren't working here in Broadmeadows gets a job. That is how wages go up or incomes go up across the, the nation. It's not just, you know, some kind of, you know, flick of a switch decision, let's give everyone a pay rise, because I can tell you what will happen. If, if the returns to companies don't go up at the same time, and if companies aren't more successful, less people will work, or prices go up. So, so I'm very concerned about this idea that we're going to return to some 1970s industrial relations model. Because what would it mean? Well, practice, the world is a very like? different place to the 1970s. I mean, the internet wasn't invented in the 1970s. We had tariff walls around the country. Uh, consumers couldn't buy things online. What, what we have to have is a cooperative model. We can't have a strike-ridden, conflict-driven industrial system. And so the language, you know, I see coming out of the trade union movement at the moment is deeply disturbing. It's deeply backward-looking. We need cooperation. We need to manage this transition together. We cannot throw the enterprise bargaining arrangements out because that's about you and, and, and everyone here sitting down with their their teams and saying, here's the world we're facing, here's how we can be more productive, here's how we can be more innovative, here's some of the changes we need to make. That can't happen in a conflict system. And the sorts of things Graham has done at Ford were done through cooperation, not conflict. And that's why there are still 2,000 people working here yeah. in northern Melbourne. If we have conflict-driven industrial relations, I, 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 you know, the enterprise is the word that is the key. You know, and once we start going to pattern bargaining and, you know, you know, I think we will really undermine Australia's competitiveness. And, and you're agreeing with that, Jeff? Oh, I, I think um, the world is calling for more collaboration, not less. Mm -hmm. So it would be certainly a retrograde step because the challenge, I think, is bigger. The dislocation that I, is described as the fourth industrial revolution, prospectively, luckily. We've got a chance to, to sort of work together to get ourselves there to, to minimise the, the dislocation. But I guess, I guess the unions would say they're not talking about conflict, they're talking about the ability to settle uh, a, a, a pay and conditions uh, agreement uh, right across the sector that would make life easier for businesses. They're, they're not talking conflict. Well, so they're calling businesses wage thieves, wage thieves. I mean, the language is pretty conflicting. I mean, it's a pretty conflictual kind of tone. It's not the tone of 
you know, if there are things that aren't working, like the, if, if there are things in the enterprise agreement system that are not working, let's sit down and say, well, OK, how do we fix them? Obviously, we want to protect people. Obviously, we want to make sure there's a good safety net. But the idea you, that we're you... going to go back to a rigid system, you know, the EBA system isn't working, so let's get rid of that. That system is about an enterprise working out how it is successful just, in cooperation with just its Just before employees. we go to a break, um, are you saying the unions are putting wage growth uh, uh, higher than the future of actual work in Australia. That well, well, it's hard to know how they. Uh, it's hard to know, looking at the material they've released this week, how they see the economy growing, how they see us creating the conditions for higher wages. Given what's happening in the economy. E exactly, and what we want to see is the conditions for higher incomes across the economy. We want to see the conditions that will grow the economy. What I hear is the language of, you know, the anti-business agenda, the sort of you know, the kind of agenda of conflict. I'm happy to sit down with them and say, well, if it's not working, how do we fix it? But we're not going to fix it by describing, you know, business, you know, in this very negative way. We're not going to fix it by chucking out things that have worked really, really well, like the EBA system. We're going to fix it by cooperating, by working together on this question of how work will be uh, constructed in the future, how we get skills working, how we make sure that we keep a strong safety net. Right. Uh, and yeah. we can't throw the baby We've, out with the bathwater no, here. Indeed. We've got to take a quick break. Uh, look, the labour costs is, is uh, one issue, but there are other pressure points uh, still for manufacturers in particular. Energy is one of them. We might get into that right after the break. Welcome back. Live from Broadmeadows in Melbourne's north tonight, we are looking at the future of manufacturing, the changes going on in the Australian economy right now. Look, every household would know right now that power prices have gone up a lot over recent years, but businesses that use a lot of energy will know this more than most. Um, I, I want to hear from, uh, from your experience on this. And Harry, uh, we were talking a little bit before the show about this. What's been your experience at APV when it comes to power prices? Uh, we're of a size where we can go and tender for power, so we actually went out to a competitive tender process, but that's still locked in a 100% increase in the retail elements of our uh, power. So your, your retail power bill... Is 100% higher than what it was higher. last How month. How long do you lock it in for? Three for, years. For three years, and that went up 100%. Correct. Wow. And when was that? Was that just... Just uh, this month. Just this month? Yeah. Ouch. So, and how much does that um, affect your uh, your bottom line? Um, luckily, we are not a significant power usage, but it, it does affect our supply chain because you know we have uh, our export products have 80% Australian content in them. A large portion of that is plastics. So they're plastic all going in, up in price. Plastic injection moulding companies use a lot of power. Right. So you're finding your input the, costs are going up. They will. Uh, Inevitably, yeah, that's right. Much, right. They're going up 20%, our power's going up 20%. So as we discussed earlier, we can't put our prices up. We have contracts with our customers fixed pricing for three years yeah. on our export contracts. So we have to find other ways to uh, recoup that money. Graham, has this been much of an issue for Ford? Um, no, not at, a, not at a corporate level. I mean, you know, we used to run casting plants and engine plants and other such things yeah. with obviously significant power requirements, but that's changed. If anything, it affects uh, our individual employees, right? At the end of the day, they've still yeah. got to dip their hand in the pocket and, and deal with a higher uh, a cost to run their household. And so we're always sensitive to that, like, like I am as well. And I hear it quite a lot. It's so sort of a, a de rigueur sort of a commentary right yeah. now. Jeff, I mean, you're part of a global business. Mm. What is the perspective that you bring on this debate that's going on and it's been going on in Australia for years, frankly, but uh, the fact that we do have such high power prices uh, now despite all the natural resources we've got, mm. the fossil fuels and so on. Uh, the narrative is the transition to um, renewable energy is, is programmed through the world. Um, we do steam turbines, for example, for, for coal-fired power plants, have done that, and those factories are largely empty globally. Making the steam turbines so for coal plants. The, the message, we keep and, and even though, and even though, and even though we make uh, the highest efficiency um, steam turbines, the world is just not demanding it. It's a bit anomalous when they're when they're ordered. It's either subsidised in a certain situation, for example, India, or for example, China. Projects that were already in the pipeline are coming online. So 
that's the first statement. So th there's a clear trend. The transition step that we all talk about is to go to gas. In our unfortunate situation in Australia, we made that dif difficult for ourselves for a number of reasons, not without any plan, but that, that step that would have formed the transition for large gas, uh, large scale, um, um, very efficient gas, we've, we've moved ourselves uh, out of that possibility to a large extent. Is it still possible to get back there with gas oh, or anything? Oh, it's too look, late? There are, there are discussions uh, around, uh, there wasn't any in the last, the last large gas plant that was built uh, was actually Mort Lake in Victoria. Mm -hmm. We delivered that some time ago to Origin, uh, and there hasn't been a project in the last seven or eight years, even on the pipeline. There's been small peakers there, which you would say is actually trying to compensate the stability in the system. Uh, and now we start to hear words in Victoria about, well, maybe we could do some exploration, maybe we could do some large-scale gas, just to, to balance the grid. And I think that's a positive step. Let's see, let's see how that It's pretty that hard balance. to have that conversation if you've got a moratorium. In, Victoria, on, on, in yeah. Victoria. I mean, you know, this is what has transformed US manufacturing, has been the unleashing of their shale the gas, gas and their cheap gas. And it, it has underpinned a resurgence in manufacturing. So if, we, if we're serious about manufacturing, we'll reduce the cost of doing business, we'll reduce red tape, we'll get a competitive tax system, and, we'll, and we won't have things like a moratorium on gas, uh, which, you know, we can't even have the sort of conversation that Jeff's talking about. It, it can be a tremendous transition fuel uh, and, and we're continuing to want to talk about, you know, going back to things that, that are not economically viable yeah. uh, and we want to, or, or conversely, let's do everything with renewables. It's not going to be like that. It's about getting the right energy mix for mm. the right cost that allows us to meet affordability, security, reliability and meet our uh, international re emissions reduction okay. commitments. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, we haven't spoken about company tax. I take it as a given that uh, everyone would love to have a company tax cut. But one thing I, I would, uh, we were talking about this a little earlier before the program, the R&D tax concession. Um, now, when we talk about clever new uh, future manufacturing, I would have thought these are exactly the sort of businesses that need R&D tax breaks you know, from, uh, from, from the government, but apparently you're not getting them. Why not, Graham? You, you, you guys, you're in design and engineering now of you know, vehicles that are being sold to the world. No, the, I mean, the, there, is, there is talks at the moment, and we'll see something in May, I think, from the government around their definition of research and development and, and incentive and taxation treatment. So You don't get any at the moment? No, no. It's a very narrow definition um, right. as it stands at the moment, and that's the government's prerogative. It does change at times as well, and I know, Jennifer, you've made comment in the past about that. And so, you know, for us, we'd, we'd like to see a little bit broader definition of R&D. Um, that would be uh, useful. Uh, at the same time, we'd like to see a stable platform for that. And the compatibility of what the government talks to in terms of, you know, innovation, advanced manufacturing, knowledge economy, that compatibility with where it uh, presents itself in terms of taxation and incentivization, I think needs, needs a bit more consistency between the two. They need to talk to each other more consistently. I, I guess, Graham, I would add, from my perspective, as a medium enterprise, that support in terms of protecting intellectual property and going through the patent process is just as important because it's about protecting my IP when I go into an international market. Is so that a nightmare at the moment, getting through it, that? It's expensive. It's a, you've, you've need very specialised people to interpret um, you know, patent law around the world, whether the pa product's patentable or not. We've made some expensive mistakes so um, government around this. Yeah, and I think for a small and medium enterprise, because of the cost, some help and the incentives with that would be useful. I, I think that the, the rigour the rigor of intellectual property handling is very good. It's one of the reasons we stay here. But the complexity yeah, yeah, yeah. of getting yourself there is the challenge. Because yeah. fair dues to, to how the government operates, it, it's a very, very rigid, mm. for good reasons, and, and, and a very strong, you know, uh, counterfeit, grey import, all sorts of things that could happen, yeah. um, don't happen here. And it happens in other parts of the world. It's one of the reasons we are here. Well, some important messages there for the government. And uh, I think some really interesting uh, points for the whole community to, to hear tonight. I really appreciate all of you joining us. We are out of time. But, um, yeah, we thank you for, for joining us and, and looking at 
not just the future of places like this, Broadmeadows, but uh, manufacturing and industry right around Australia. So I uh, appreciate it. Our next uh, one of these, our next Strong Australia, is going to be in Penrith. It's on the 17th of May. We're going to be focusing on infrastructure there in Penrith. Uh, you can buy tickets to come along during the afternoon session that we run, one like we did here in Broadmeadows today. Uh, get on to strongaustralia.com.au from tomorrow to buy tickets to that one. Hopefully we'll uh, see you uh, for the broadcast of that one as well. Thanks for your company tonight. Paul Murray is next.